What's up everybody, Pastor Matt here. All right, we gotta talk about the title of this video before we go any further, Pussyfooting Pastors. I don't want anybody writing in and telling me that I used a bad word in this video or in the title of this video, I did not use a bad word. Pussyfooting is a real word and it happens to be the exact word that I want to use in this context because if you look up the word pussyfooting uh, in the dictionary, here's what you get. This is Merriam-Webster, all right? To tread or move warily or stealthily. That's the first definition, or to refrain from committing oneself. Okay, so this has a, a technical, well-understood, well-received definition to this word. In fact, just for the fun of it, I looked it up in another place too. This is dictionary.com. Dictionary.com describes the word, defines the word pussyfooting as to go or move in a stealthy or cautious manner, to act cautiously or timidly as if afraid to commit oneself on a point at issue, okay? So this is exactly the right word to talk about uh, this particular viewer question that I got, and I'm gonna read that viewer question here in just a moment. So to review, no bad words were said in the title or content of this video. It's like the word associate, uh, which has a bad word at the beginning, but it isn't itself a bad word. It's like shih tzu, which, which is a kind of dog, but it's not a bad word. Uh, it's like Hellman's mayonnaise, which has a bad word at the beginning, but is not a bad word. Okay, so we're clear. We're all good. We're, Pastor Matt is not swearing at any point in this video, right? Okay, so let's get into the question. This is from Ty from New Jersey. Uh, he's a YouTube viewer. He says this, what is your view on timid pastors? He says, as an example, at my small church, my preacher knows that there are individuals in the church who support abortion. And because of this, he doesn't condemn it to avoid hurting personal relationships. The same goes for homosexual marriage. It personally bothers me, writes Ty, that he's too timid to speak out against it because having had one-on-one -on -one conversations with him, he knows it's wrong and very much disagrees with it. So, so what is this pastor doing? Well, he is literally pussyfooting around the issue. And of course, that word comes from the idea of a cat a cat which walks very carefully. If you've ever seen a cat on a desk, for instance, for some of you who have cats, I'm a dog person myself, but if you've ever seen a cat walk around on a desk, they very, very tenderly and gingerly walk around some of these things. Sometimes they'll knock over a glass of milk or something like that. But it's a, it's a good visual word that indicates how somebody is very carefully stepping around an issue without getting into the issue itself. And one of my critiques when I look out at broader evangelicalism today here in 2022 is one of my fears is that Ty is right and there are too many pastors like Ty's pastor who pussyfoot around some of the issues that we need to confront in our day with our Bibles in hand and with love in our hearts and with tears perhaps in our eyes and from behind the authority of, of the pulpit where God's word is expected to be preached, preached, <laughs> preached uh, we cannot avoid certain issues to discuss them in our day. Uh, so, so let me just suggest here, I'm still laughing at preached, um, that, that this might actually be a disqualifying sin. And here I'm going to get a little bit serious in this video here because cowardice, I'm afraid, uh, simply doesn't comport with the kind of character and the attributes that pastors are required to have in those passages in scripture where the characteristics of pastoral leadership are so defined. So uh, let's go to Titus chapter one. Now we could look also at, uh, at 1 Timothy, which has qualifications for elders and deacons, but Titus chapter one is particularly poignant here in speaking to this issue of, of a godly boldness or a the holy courage that's required for those who would be preachers of the word. So here's what Paul says to Titus here. For an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. Okay, so that that's in terms of character, character and morality. He wouldn't use bad words in his, uh, his YouTube videos. Uh, he must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violence or greedy for gain. No question about that. But hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, the Bible says, upright, holy, and disciplined. Now, here, here comes, I think, the salient language on this topic. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction and sound doctrine and also able to rebuke those who contradict it, okay? Um, he must hold firm to sound doctrine and be able to contradict 
to rebuke those who contradicted it. And that's why, if, you know, if he can't do that, then I'm afraid to say it this way, but I'm not sure that this individual is actually qualified for pastoral leadership. What do you think? Um, especially when Paul then goes on to delineate some of the kinds of problems that Titus is going to encounter in his, in his ministry. So one of the reasons why Paul gives this counsel to Titus is that he would be emboldened and uh, that he would be courageous enough to carry out the kind of gospel ministry that becomes those who are ordained to the task. So listen to what follows next. Because some are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, I'm in verse 10, especially those of the circumcision party. So there's a particular group within the church that Titus has to confront. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Quite a quote there. This testimony is true, therefore rebuke them sharply so that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. So my goodness, how would you like to be Titus and get this letter from the Apostle Paul? And here's your job description. He says, Titus, I want you to go into the church and you're going to have to rebuke the insubordinate because you've got a group of deceivers in there. There's a particular heresy okay, that he has to confront, the circumcision party. You have to silence these people, which is easier said than done. And when necessary, you need to be courageous enough to rebuke them sharply. Um, I think that's a pretty tall order. And yet that kind of courage is exactly what's expected of those who would be ordained to the office. So when we think about the history of redemption, we look back to the Old Testament and we see all kinds of examples of courage in, in terms of the, the proclamation ministry of the word of God. Moses has to go in. He has to confront Pharaoh, which is a serious power encounter. Okay, he's got, he's got to preach up to the king of Egypt, who has the power to inflict serious uh, repercussions on Moses's people. Elijah has to confront the Baal prophets. It's like 700 to 1, right? Um, the, the apostles in the book of Acts, they have to be willing to confront all of all of the governmental authorities in all of the various regions that are trying to oppress them and to silence them. With the power of physical bodily punishment against them. They're going to get whipped and flogged and beaten and beaten and uh, and exiled to Patmos and so on and so forth. Paul himself is going to receive the 40 lashes minus one. Ah, oh, my goodness. Um, yeah, so we have to be brave enough to confront whatever it is that, that resists us in, in the culture. Now, let me just say this, uh, Ty. There is a, a difference, I, I would hope, that we can recognize between this kind of godly audacity which requ is required of the pulpiteer and sort of a brash foolishness of, of those who would simply run in and create controversy everywhere. I've seen that done in the ministry. It's always sad and repugnant and sort of upsetting to the stomach to see these guys that, that, sen that you know, the sense is that they just love controversy. They can't wait to offend somebody. I'm not saying that a pastor should be like that, okay? Uh, I, I don't think pastors should be given to controversy. Now, there are certain people that just seem to surround themselves with controversy everywhere they go and every conversation they get into, it ends up being a fight. I mean, that's a problem too. I think there's a brash foolishness that, uh, that pastors really ought to avoid. If anything, pastors ought to be a salve to the wounds of the congregation. Their ministry is a healing ministry. When we preach the word of God, we hope that people would get healed from what they hear therein. Um, ours is a reconciling ministry where a part of our goal as pastors is to reconcile our church together when there are factions to bring them into a greater state of unity and harmony when possible. And yet, even as a brash foolishness is unbecoming of a gospel minister, unfortunately, the opposite is also true, that the kind of cowardice or unwillingness to confront the difficult issues of the day, it's just not really going to work. It's not really going to work because it mutes the church's vibrant witness in an unbelieving world. Now, I will tell you this. I have a non-confrontational type of personality. I don't like to fight. Um, it bothers me. When I get in conflict, I like to resolve it as quickly as possible. I understand that a lot of us are just not cut from the cloth that, that likes to fight, either, you know, physical fisticuffs, which obviously Paul says no way to in Titus chapter one, right? Because he can't be a violent person. 
but um, there's there's a great lot of us who just want to coexist with our brothers and sisters in the church in peace. And yet, there there is a, a mantle upon us. There is a burden upon our shoulders that we have to speak to the issues of our day. Sometimes that's going to threaten the unity of the congregation. Sometimes it's actually going to result in greater unity within the congregation once these matters are spoken of clearly and biblically. Now, look, I'll be the first one to admit that there are certain topics that I, I prefer not to have to deal with from the pulpit. They're not my favorite, okay? I'd rather preach on the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Okay, I can do that all day. But there are times where we have to confront sexual sin, for instance. Uh, there are times where we have to preach on hell. There are times where we have to preach on the judgment to come. Uh, there, even tithing, I'm not, I'm not super comfortable teaching about tithing, but it's in the Bible, and so I have to be faithful to that. Polemical topics are, are pr particularly stressful for me. As a pastor, I'll, I can even tell you a story. Um, when I was going through my previous preaching series on Thessalonians, when we came to uh, the man of lawlessness, I had prepared this entire message on the historical revor reformed view about the Pope uh, being the Antichrist and the early versions of the Westminster Confession of Faith and in the theology of many of the reformers. And I had this whole kind of uh, historical paragraph that I was going to preach. And I, I look out into the congregation, and, and here is uh, these guests that had just come to church. They've never been to Gospel Fellowship ever once before. And uh, they sat down. I knew for a fact, because I knew the family, that they were Roman Catholics. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, I'm just going to call the Pope the Antichrist on their very first day. They're never going to come back. And, in fact, they didn't come back. But... As much as I was dying inside as I'm preaching to the people that day, um, that was my message. That's what the Lord had laid upon my heart from this text. I had to go back through some of the Reformed history related to that line, the man of, the man of lawlessness. And I, I didn't want to be afraid to do it. I didn't want to pussyfoot around the issue. I just wanted to deliver the message that I had prepared with confidence and hopefully love and grace and kindness too, but certainly confidence and so, look, at the end of the day, Ty, I'm going to leave you with this. I think this is one of the reasons why expository preaching is so important in today's church. If you do topical-based um, preaching series, okay, like we'll do the five solos in October for Reformation Sunday, whatever. But most of the pastor's ministry should be expository preaching through books of the Bible, chapter by chapter, and paragraph by paragraph. Now, you don't have to move so slow as to do it verse by verse and take 25 years to work through the book of Galatians. I'm not saying that. But chapter by chapter and paragraph by paragraph, we should base most of our preaching ministry on an expository model. And here's why. Because when we come up to those difficult texts, let's say some issues about sexuality or homosexuality, or issues that pertain to life, or issues related to gluttony, or lust, or divorce, or whatever, and we know it's going to be difficult for some of the people in the congregation, then we can simply look out on our people and we can say, today we find ourselves in this paragraph, let's deal with it. And then everybody knows that the pastor is not being mean, he's not picking on anybody, He's not going after anybody. Uh, there's no kind of subtweeting happening from the pulpit that day. No, that's not what he's doing. He's faithfully working through biblical texts of the Bible, and therefore there's no offense perceived and none actually given. The pastor is just preaching to his people. And that brings me to the final point that I, I might want to bring up here, Ty, and that is that while there are pastors who will pussyfoot around the issues and ignore them so as not to have to take a side, <sighs> Sometimes um, the congregation does too. And if you have a pussyfooting pastor, you might actually be pussyfooting around the issue of having to deal with him. Maybe it's time for the elders to speak to him gently at first, uh, but more firmly later, about that godly attribute of courage. It is, after all, required for those who would preach the gospel. Thank you so much for checking into this video. I do love you lots, and we'll talk to you later.